Yeah, so a few words about uh, the place where I come from. Um, so it's, it's translated as uh, an experiment, I mean, still it is an experiment, but it's been uh, an exponentially growing experiment, which is somewhat interesting for a university uh, experiment. So we started around, you know, a, a table hardly bigger than this one, and now we have about 7,000 square meters, because we've been growing exponentially in, in the last 15 years, about doubling every 18 months or so. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is, you know, to say briefly, hack the university from inside and try to help students that, and, and scientists and teachers that want to reinvent the way we learn, teach and do research and mobilize collective intelligence towards meaningful things and going beyond all sorts of boundaries that universities tend to have, which apparently you manage also to overcome uh, at your levels. And that's why I'm very impressed because not that many people, that, that diverse group of people are able to gather. Uh, so we try to, you know, in the French, I'm, I'm sure the Belgium system is much better, uh, but the French system is very rigid. Uh, we tend to like to have boxes and to have people that sink in boxes. And so to have a place where people can sink out of boxes is somewhat different. And I guess that's why we've, you know, had the chance to attract lots of people that were feeling too constraints in whatever uh, domains they were uh, having. Uh, talking about evolutionary uh, transition, uh, I work myself with John Leonard Smith, that I guess some of you uh, know, that was uh, an evolutionist interested in, in these sorts of transition. And um, by training, and I, I, I say a few words, you know, I'm first an engineer and then uh, uh, I did my PhD in first evolution, I mean in molecular genetics, and then I did my postdoc with John on evolutionary systems biology. And uh, that's the sort of things that I've been doing. So um, last year, I was working at the request of our French government. Uh, or Minister of Education, Higher Education Research, on what would be, why can we have an R&D to reinvent the way we learn uh, and educate people? And that's, you know, in France, we spend about as much money on education and health, but we spend nearly no money on education research, whereas we spend quite a lot of money on biomedical research. And coming from biomedical research, you know, and having been awarded <laughs> quite a lot of that money, I knew <laughs> that this was not, uh, the best way to do it if you want to have something that evolves. Okay. Uh, and so education system in France has been designed not to evolve, basically. Uh, and uh, so, you know, when you come from a regional perspective and you're interested in knowledge transition and so on, uh, you realize that, you know, there's a problem there. So progressively we've been uh, discussing with ever more people and, you know, we were interested in learning communities and learning communities at all scale, you know, ends up at the learning plant scale. We could go to the galaxy, but we're not there yet. Uh, and um, so if you do find this you know, extraterrestrial intelligence, let us know. We'll, we'll be quite interested to, to be able to discuss with them uh, on you know, how to expand the, the concept uh, at a larger scale. Um, and so basically the way we define uh, any learning community, including the, the planetary one, is um, to think about uh, how, can, how can it be that when someone has learned something, someone else can learn more easily, because the first one can share. Uh, and that's done more easily. I mean, it's always been true. We could say that, you know, our planet has been a learning planet for quite some while. And, uh, but that thanks to digital technology, we can share at scale, whereas we used to be able to share only at a sort of local scale like we're doing now. And, and so, you know, what this uh, transition does uh, is, and how can we reorganize uh, for this transition? Uh, is maybe uh, what we're interested in. So, you know, a learning planet would be a planet that would systematically organize to facilitate this sort of learning experience between communities uh, and between individuals. And there would, there would be a lot of reflexivity on what it is to learn and what it is to learn and to learn as individual and as collective. That's more or less the, the way we're trying to push it. So I'll give a few examples and, and some background of where I come from. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. I'll start, I mean, I guess lots of you know this slide, but maybe not all of you, so I'll take some time to describe for the non-biologists in the room or the, the ones that are not necessarily familiar with, with these sorts of things. Or tell me if you know, this is all obvious for you. Um, but basically, you know, we started uh, from basic molecules on this planet that progressively uh, uh, assembled, uh, complexified, got the ability to reproduce, evolve, uh, and create higher level of organization progressively, starting from, you know, typically, uh, we, we believe there was a, a prebiotic soup with RNA worlds emerging first, and DNA, then cells, 
uh, and then progressively more and more complex cells by fusing different types of cells. Uh, eventually, you know, brain evolved, uh, and the brains, uh, some of those brains were able to learn from other brains, which is not the default mode of, of brains, uh, which suppose that there is some sort of communication and info transfer from brains to brains. Uh, and that might be due to all sorts of processes, uh, including language, which is a very refined way of transferring information from one brain to another one. Uh, and you know, if you have a language that is a very generic one, then you can start uh, sharing all sorts of notions. Uh, and that might have been you know, one of the specificity of four uh, species uh, appearance. And then we've evolved all sorts of uh, ways to communicate at larger scale, writing being one of them, because you know, suddenly you can communicate across time and space. And of course, digital technology uh, came and allowed us to expand all this uh, at much further scale. And what's interesting is that you know, there is, it looks like there is an acceleration uh, of those transition if you put them on the sort of a log scale for the time. Uh, and that there is you know, an ever-growing numbers of digits that can be stored and shared, uh, and also the speed at which this will happen. So that's uh, part of <coughs> what brought us here. And now you have, you know, we start to do all sorts of uh, new things. We are able to, you know, if I was an extraterrestrial uh, form of intelligence and looking at what's happening on this planet, I would have seen some of the transition on, on this. But I would be interested in what's going to happen next because we are a species that is able to modify other genome species, but also our own genomes, uh, which is quite new. I mean, at least on this planet, that's the first time this is happening. Um, we're able to create new digital technology that have the ability to replicate, to evolve, to recombine, uh, and for some of them to even self-reproduce. So we can produce robots that self-reproduce these days, okay. uh, and eventually have all sorts of evolutionary dynamics. Uh, so all these things are quite new and quite specific to our time. So even from an evolutionary uh, perspective, I think we are in some sort of a transition. In, uh, and so if you look at the transition of the past, uh, there is uh, nearly always some sort of a Red Queen paradigm. I don't know if you're all familiar with the Red Queen, but you know, Lewis Carroll, uh, that's one of his favorite character. And Lewis, uh, uh, the Red Queen and Alice were running very fast and they were not moving. And Alice was somewhat surprised by the fact they were not moving. And uh, she was uh, asking the Red Queen, and the Red Queen answer was, if you want to move, if you want to move in, if you want to stay in the same place in this country, you have to run as fast as you can. And if you want to go somewhere else, you have to run twice faster. Okay? And so it's sort of the arms race uh, paradigm where you know, if others are evolving faster than you do, you'll be under, you'll become obsolete quite fast. Okay? And so that can explain why there was this acceleration of transition I was mentioning. And uh, this is a very good paradigm for all sorts of things, uh, including, uh, for instance, predator and prey. Clearly, the predator runs faster than the prey. There is a strong selective pressure on the, for the prey. Uh, and so they would be uh, both running faster and faster. That's also true between us and bacteria, for instance. So we've invented antibiotics and antibodies and vaccines and so on. And so we managed to uh, get ahead uh, of the race against microbes. But uh, more recently, we have uh, multi-resistant antibacteria that are able to resist everything. And in fact, what they do is they run faster again. Okay? And so that's one of the things I was doing, which is to study the, what we call the evolution of the mutation rate or the mutability. Uh, and so mutation rate can vary up to 10,000 fold. Uh, and so of course, you generate lots of bad mutations, but you also generate more lottery tickets. And you know, sometimes you're lucky enough to end up getting those. And, um, and so that's sort of things I was doing for my PhD and, and with John Maynard Smith and, and, and some others. And uh, we've also worked on the cooperation of bacteria. Bacteria cooperate, they exchange information, they cooperate on how to exchange information, and they exchange information on how to cooperate. And they do all this you know, without any ministry of education or technology or whatever. You know, this is all self-organized, of course. Uh, and another thing that they do, which I find quite interesting, is, is uh, niche construction. And niche construction is basically the same, uh, for those that don't know, uh, that the beaver do. Okay? So beavers uh, don't like streams, they prefer lakes. So what they do is when they have no lake, they build a dam and they transform a stream into a lake. Okay? And so modifying your environment is clearly an interesting way of adapting to the circumstances under which you are. And clearly humans are very good at this. We build buildings, we build all sorts of infrastructures that help us adapt to all sorts of niches. 
Okay, so we do build our own niche. But it's interesting to see that you know this, all these things you can do experiments with. You can model uh, and you can uh, measure all sorts of parameters and you can have uh, interesting experimental model of evolution because generation time of bacteria is 20 minutes. Okay? And you can work even with viruses and some viruses of bacteria makes uh, up to 10 to the 14, 10 to the 4 descendants in 20 minutes, which is 10 to the 12 uh, per hour. Okay. So you can generate you know, fast numbers and do a lot of experimental evolution. So that's part of what I was doing uh, uh, when I was uh, actively uh, searching these this fields. And uh, you can also study aging, for instance, um, in bacteria, and, and suddenly you can, you can get statistics that usually you don't get uh, with uh, human beings because you cannot control the environment the same way, and, and you can do this for uh, large populations. Uh, so all these major transitions uh, were as defined by John Maynard Smith and Ursula Murray, and, and John um, was saying that all of these transitions I was alluding to are associated with some sort of conflict between replicators, be between the lower level of organization and the higher level of organization. And so for those of you that do game theory, you know, typically game theory is played uh, between cheaters and, and cooperators at all of those levels. Uh, and now that we are under some sort of new transition, we can ask ourselves, you know, what are the upper levels and what are the conflicts that will be uh, arising? And, and you know, maybe what's interesting in the transition we live now is that we are able to reflect on the past transition and on the transition we undergo. I don't believe, you know, bacteria are very self-reflexive. I mean, I love them. I believe they can do a lot of things, <laughs> but I don't believe they can self-reflect. Um, and even you know when we were say inventing printing, uh, we m might have been aware that we were doing something great, like for writing, for instance. But we were not necessarily aware that you know there were many other transitions in the past uh, that we could learn from. And so I think what we are living now is somewhat special in that respect as well. Right? So if you are again coming from you know outer space and studying transition, you know the transition that happens when uh, the ad agents are able to self-reflect on the transition they are undergoing is probably an interesting transition. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can re-influence really the transition we go <laughs> undergo, because you know being a, being aware is not necessarily being able to uh, uh, foster a different turn. But if we are aware of different options, maybe we can uh, influence some of the niche construction we are building together. And so I think that's that's you know, even from a purely evolutionary standpoint, a very interesting period. Plus, as a human living in that period, you know, obviously <laughs> we are somewhat concerned by but what's happening. Um, and so, in fact, I'm interested in the, the coevolution between information and action. You know, so typically, information that can lead to a genotype, you know, a genotype that can lead to some phenotype, which is one example of this what I call inform action uh, and the way they evolve. Uh, but I think that you know this is such a complex field. You know, there is many different disciplines involved uh, in studying the technology, in studying the the, the history, in studying the, the biology, uh, and the various dimensions of the biology. Uh, that I think if we really want to tackle such a question, we have to bring experts of different disciplines like you're doing here, but you also have to try to do this at scale. Uh, and you have to try to invite students and scientists from all over the world to uh, contribute to define uh, as precisely as possible those various transition. And um, you should try to uh, build theories and, and do experiments whenever it's possible to try to uh, enlarge the, the understanding and progressively uh, the debates with citizens. Because I think, you know, if we're undergoing a transition, we have to have the largest possible debates around this. Because, you know, of course, it's not just an ivory tower academy uh, issue. So that's um, this. And do stop me. I mean, let's try to make this as interactive as possible. Because I. I imagine you know so much that you know I'm going somewhat fast on some of this, but nevertheless there might be reactions or or um, intuitions uh, about uh, this. No? Yeah. Can you? Uh, <coughs> I mean, is the, what is the definition of a major? Can you remind us what is the definition of a major transition for? Uh, so that, that's a good question. So for, for John Maynard Smith, the major transition was uh, a new level of organization and a new level of replication. Okay. And, and to some extent, you could say that you know, giving birth to entities that self-replicate 
is slightly different. It's not a, it's not a super organism uh, in the sense that we are not yet uh, symbiotic uh, with our AI, for instance, or, or these sorts of things. Okay? And that would eventually lead to an, a yet another level. Okay? So I mean, the transition, uh, I mean, the major transition has usually lots of minor transition into it. Okay? Uh, and we probably have had some of the minor transition within that major transition, but probably not all of them. So we are not reproducing, for instance, as uh, humanity as a whole. We are reproducing, we are still reproducing individually, but we clearly our information uh, that we are sharing through digital technology is is something very new. Okay, and so that's one of the reasons I was presenting bacteria is that they had sort of a minor transition, but which is somewhat related to ours, which is that they are able to transfer horizontally genetic information from one cell to the other. So they can reproduce vertically, <coughs> like any clonal organism, but they can also share information horizontally very fast. We call this plasmids typically. And, um, and, and, and this plasmid can spread uh, very quickly in a population. And they co-evolve not only what is transferred, but the means to transfer. Okay? And, and, and there is a, a selective pressure both on the donor of information and also on the recipient of information. And clearly, you know, there is no fake news in bacteria, but there can be uh, pieces of information that you receive that have very detrimental to you. Okay? Uh, and so there is a cost of receiving uh, information, and you can clearly be manipulated uh, by others. Okay? Because that information that is bad for you might not be bad for the donor. Okay? So there is all sorts of tricks that bacteria play on each other, and that you know, these plasmid dynamics have. And so that's why you know, I'm so I mean, I've been studying this, this sorts of models and, and the co-evolution between the ability to give, to receive, and the ability to be transferred, because there is these three abilities. Okay? There is the one of the donor, the one of the receiver, and the one of the information being transferred. Okay? And so all this uh, can co-evolve uh, at that scale. So to some extent, this is one of the interesting moments uh, that looks a little like what we are doing, because suddenly you have um, an increased flow of horizontal transfer information. You know, the first brains that were able to connect to one another was a similar transition of suddenly connecting. Uh, and so when you change the connectivity uh, and the flow of information beyond the vertical uh, fluxes that are classical in, in organism uh, reproducing, uh, you create uh, a new game. Okay? And these sorts of new games have all sorts of properties, including the manipulation ones, and, but also the ability to cooperate. So typically, bacteria exchange information on how to cooperate. <coughs> uh, when the bacteria gives information to potentially another one, what's the benefit for the b bacteria that give it? The fact that its information might be replicated? So, so there is a selfish interest of the information being transferred. That's one component. But another one is typically uh, a collective action uh, a question and, and typically a game theory position. So typically, it's costly to transfer information. But if you transfer information on how to do something together that you cannot do alone, there is a benefit for the bacteria that is transferring it. Okay? So typically, degrading antibiotics is typically transferred on those plasmids. Because degrading antibiotics is very hard for a single bacteria, which is only a micron uh, long. Uh -huh. okay? But yeah. if billions of bacteria share the information on how to destroy the antibiotics, then the bacteria collectively have a chance to survive. Yeah, yeah. And the, the plasmid, uh, so the horizontal uh, transfer, was it, uh, did it appear um, a long time after the first bacteria? Not that, I mean, we, we cannot even score, I mean, we cannot even uh, answer the question precisely, okay. but presumably very quickly. Okay. okay. I mean, horizontal transfer might have happened even before the first cell to some extent. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, parasites are typically evolving faster than host. Okay. And people describe plasmids as parasites. Okay? And clearly there's one part of what they're doing. But they're also, you know, like lots of our own parasites, we can transform them into mutualists. Okay? If we manage to align interest uh, between uh, the host and the uh, symbiotic organism that is living together with the first one. So there is lots of pathogenic and mutualistic relationship that can happen uh, and also uh, Manipulation games that are being played. So between the donor, the receiver, and the plasmids, you have you know a free players game uh, that is uh, being played. Mm -hmm. And bacteria can the the variance in the uh, 
probability for a given plasmid to be transferred between two bacteria depending on the genotype within the same species is 10 to the 8. Okay. So it's like, you know, if there is a human talking a lot, <laughs> and then the human's completely deaf, you know, and, and that variance of communication uh, is 10 to the 8 uh, among the bacterial world. Uh, you mean that to the eight more per, more things that are given out and are picked, picked up? Yes, so in fact it's 10 to the 4, and there is a 10 to the 4 fold difference between the best donor and the worst donor, and a 10 to the 4 fold difference between the best receiver and the worst receiver, and these two are independent, so you have this multiplication effect that is a 10 to the 8 uh, variability uh, range. Ah, variability, yeah. It's like with humans, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never got the numbers for humans that I <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> and so so that that sort of you know helped me prepare to you know, I I basically know nothing about the web except like, you know, what everybody else do know. But you know, I was working on these sorts of questions uh, on the bacteria for some time and, and that helped me to understand, you know. Uh, self-organization when information transfer and cooperation becomes available at, at large scale. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In the web, that's how uh, open source or open access works. You put something on the web and somebody else may use it or not use it. But uh, I have analyzed some of the motivation for people to put things on the web and one of the motivations they have is that by putting something on the web, somebody else may either give them feedback, which gives them a signal how to improve, or they can get reputation, or somebody can actually improve the thing they put out. Like you put a, a, a program out that you have written yourself, somebody else improves it and adds some functions, then it becomes advantage for you to, to take it back. Yeah, and, and you know, even if you look at, uh, I mean, that's, that's very interesting. And I, I discussed with some anthropologists uh, that worked on, you know, what are humans teaching to one another? And, and who are you teaching what to? Okay. So typically, uh, there are things that remain in families. Okay. There are typically vertically transmitted uh, information, like you know, where there is a scarce resource. You're not going to spread this to everyone. You're going to give this information where the best mushrooms are, or the best you know, water, clean water, or whatever, depending on whatever is limiting in your environment. Uh, you're going to transfer typically only to uh, your kins. Uh, and that's, you know, kin selection can easily explain this. And there's all sorts of species that do transfer uh, and teach. For instance, um, meerkats teach their babies. How do you hunt for uh, scorpio? Uh, scorpion? Mm -hmm. Scorpion. Um, and uh, and so clearly, you know, that's that's a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so teaching uh, is defined in, in these uh, sort of settings as something that is expensive for the teacher and beneficial for the receiver, okay? And that's clearly the case, you know, if the only food source you have in the desert is Scorpio, you have to be able to eat it. But clearly, you know, uh, this is a very dangerous game. And, and one of the things that the, the mother America does is she, she gives higher level of complexity progressively to the, to the, to the, to the young one, uh, starting with dead Scorpio with no sting uh, and ending with live Scorpio with sting. Okay, <laughs> so you can really see that if you have to do this, <laughs> you step by step. you're going to do it step by step and, and there is some risk uh, uh, in the game and, and some benefit in the game. So that's the sort of things you can see in, in various species. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, what would you teach to non-kins? Like if bacteria can uh, exchange information with kins, that's easy, but they also exchange information with non-kins. And typically the information they exchange with non-kins is uh, a collective action information. Okay, it's an information that will allow them to do niche construction together. <coughs> and I think humans tend to do the same. That's what I've heard. Okay? So if you believe in religion, uh, you want others to share the same religion, so you teach religion to non-kids. Okay? If you believe in, I don't know, the, the state of law, you want to, to, or democracy, you want to teach democracy to everyone else because we can live uh, together in a democratic society. So, so there is all sorts of things that we do teach um, and I think some of this is also happening on the web. Okay? Uh, people are teaching a lot of things uh, to one another through the web, through YouTube videos, and so on. And clearly there is a reputation game, which bacteria don't have. They don't have a reputation system. 
Uh, another of the motivations I've looked at is altruism, and the altruism in this case is if I teach my knowledge to others, then these others will do better. But assuming that these others are in the same community as me, if they do better, I also do better. Yes. So, so is this initial instruction a uh, type of ID? Yeah. Um, uh, so that's more or less the background where I come from and, and the sort of open question that we'll be very happy to be able to address. Okay. So some of the, the, the coming slides are to some extent a little different, but uh, also somewhat complementary in the sense of, you know, why do we teach and what do we teach and how do we teach, how these things are evolving, okay, and should they be evolving, okay. Uh, and clearly, I'm sure in Belgium you evolve much faster than we do in France, because we tend to be very conservative on these things, but uh, we are evolving uh, rather slowly and uh, we have to find lots of mental barriers, so I, I love these slides to express uh, this. And, you know, clearly one of the things that is interesting about mental barriers is that you know only those that fall. You don't know those that you still have. And so I probably still have thousands, but, you know, I can tell you only about the one I know that um, I managed to escape. From, yeah. escape. Um, so one of the things that actually I learned from my uh, daughter, so, you know, reverse uh, uh, <laughs> learning in, uh, among generations happened also in... Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with Louis Braille uh, and his history. Are you? No? So Louis Braille is the one that invented the Braille. Uh, and Louis Braille uh, got blind when he was four years old. When he was 12, he heard a conference, because he was in a center for the blind kids, and he, he heard a conference on how would you transfer information in the dark. So soldiers were trying to transfer information in the dark, uh, and he heard the captain you know, lecturing about this. And you realize that this was not very efficient to transfer just numbers of guns and, and you know, numbers of people, that you wanted a generic uh, system to transfer information in the dark. Okay. And that's basically what he did. Okay. So he invented the Braille, I guess you know, it's one of the first digital uh, communication scheme. Uh, and he invented this between age uh, 12 and 15. Okay. So that's interesting, it shows that you know, bright people that you know, have a, a given problem might be able to solve it. Interestingly, the adults didn't want him to spread this because they didn't understand the point. Because they were, they, they could see and the Braille looked uh, complex for them uh, versus you know, having to learn on care letters, which was the, the dominant mode uh, that they had access to uh, before that. And uh, because he was living in the dormitories with all the blind kids, you know, it spread among them. Mm. Okay? And so this is typically an example of spreading not only information, but spreading the way to spread information. Uh, and that's uh, an interesting moment. And um, mm -hmm. interestingly, Ellen Keller, you probably know, she had even harder uh, problems uh, to overcome. And uh, that woman managed to overcome some of the barriers and got also influenced by Wee Braille, so uh, that Helen Keller was able to read and write uh, in Braille. Uh, and so this is also an example of you know, uh, large scale, uh, temporal and spatial uh, scale of information transfer. Um, among the young ones, and Hélène Keller was uh, in Paris when Louis Braille's um, ashes entered Le Panthéon, you know, this place we have in Paris, and um, she made a lecture, uh, and interestingly she said, you know, the only thing that is worse than being blind is to lack a vision. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, you know, that, that's, that's for me uh, quite a moving thing, but it basically shows the creativity of children uh, and their ability to co-evolve with information systems and eventually to even create their own information system. And I think a lot of this is, is happening these days, but uh, we can go further, and we are a little more aware of what's happening. So this is one of my uh, favorite slides. Um, I don't know if you know the work of Alison Gopney. She's a cognitive scientist working in Berkeley, and she basically shown that we're all born scientists, that you know, we can all, since we we're born, make observation, form hypothesis, perform experiments, analyze data, report our findings, and invite others to reproduce our results. <laughs> that's basically what we all do uh, uh, throughout our lives. And you know, we have different rituals uh, and methodologies to do that. But you know, this can start very, very young. And indeed, the, the youngest authors of scientific publications are eight years old. So Louis Braille didn't publish when he was 15 his discovery. You know, he could. And I guess he could have had nicer words for what he had invented. Uh, if adults had been aware of the importance of what he was doing then. But um, even eight years old can publish scientific papers. Um, and 
A lot of those that publish scientific papers are in fact children of scientists, which was not the case of Rui Braille, but uh, it's the case of many of them. And, and so we were asking whether if you were inviting kids of disfavored communities to start questioning the world and you know, follow the scientific method and eventually get mentorship of uh, benevolent mentors, typically uh, grown-up scientists that, that work with them, and offer them not answers but methodologies, uh, this can go quite far. So we have a program in French called Saventurier, which is you know knowledge adventure. Uh, and we um, spread that program now from kindergarten to high school, including professional schools. And um, and we've found nice scientists that come from all sorts of disciplines, you know, from robotics to astrophysics to cognitive science to law to sociology to history to biodiversity and so on, biotech. And, uh, and each time we have young kids, I mean kids of all age typically, that uh, are undergoing some experiments and are learning a lot uh, in terms of you know, the ability to cooperate, to develop critical thinking, to document what they do, to define experimental method and, and analyze their own data and, and so on. So that's one of the things we, we, we've done and that's why we were somewhat convinced that you know, different ways to educate was possible. And that's in this age where answers are so easy to get uh, through the web, uh, maybe questions would be something that should be refined and the ability to question the world uh, should be one of the, uh, the things that we should help kids to, um, to refine. Uh, one of the other points is that the peak age of questioning is four years old. Okay. So what can be done not for it to decline too fast and uh, how can you be measure nurtured? that by just counting the number of questions? Uh, yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Well, there is a whole field which is uh, busy with philosophy for children. Yes. Because precisely they have realized that at maybe four years old, the children start to ask very difficult and philosophical questions. Yes, actually. exactly. And so they try to. So we work with the UNESCO chair. I mean, I do have a UNESCO chair on, on learning, and, and there is we have a friend that has a UNESCO chair on philosophy for children. And uh, I, I have one for learning science. And, um, and so we work with them. And, and indeed, you know. Uh, we try to, like the old Greek used to do, you know, uh, foster uh, both philosophical questioning and scientific questioning uh, back to back and, and get the, the, the children to nurture themselves um, and, um, and develop their ability to argument, to critically think. And I don't know if you read this book called um, The Enigma of Reason, but it's an interesting book. Uh, I read this last summer on um, by Dan Sperber. And, and, and Dan, uh, in this culture, I've shown that um, our brain does not evolve as philosophers would like it to, uh, in the sense of being super rational, uh, etc. We have all sorts of uh, individual irrational uh, behavior uh, in all sorts of tests that have been uh, developed. But interestingly, we are not very good at critically um, uh, analyze our own thoughts, but we are very good at analyzing others' people. <laughs> uh, and, and if you ask people for ideas and let enough time spend that they forget it was their ideas and give them their ideas but they forgot it's their ideas, then they, come, they can become very critical. <laughs> 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 so there's also the ego dimension uh, on this. And, and the idea is that you know, we've developed critical thinking not to be manipulated uh, by others. Uh, and also we've developed communication to be able to cooperate. So clearly we have to cooperate but we don't want to be manipulated, okay? And so critical thinking is sort of a, an immune system uh, for the brain, if you want. Um, and, and interestingly, bacteria have you know, their own immune system, and, and we all, uh, every system that is complex and open uh, has to have a sort of an immune system to protect itself. And so how do we develop that critical thinking and this immune system in individual children, in collectives, uh, and eventually on the web? Those are our questions that, you know, with the fake news era and, and you could see the fake news as the sort of the pathogenic dimension of the collective intelligence or of the learning planet, if you want. And so that's the, uh, one of the questions we are trying to, to discuss in our center. Um, there is things that are, you know, as a philosopher you know, and, and have, have been very important, and how do you foster them? Okay? And know thyself is not a dimension that is at the heart of the French school uh, education. Uh, and, you know, what, what can be done uh, to, to change this? Especially in, a, in an age where you know uh, there is so many dimensions that are possible, 
uh, to each one of us which one really motivates us, uh, what are you know, our inner uh, thoughts, what are our emotions, how do we recognize them, and how do we learn from this. Um, so how do we build this at old age? I also like this picture on collective intelligence. I, I imagine you all know this legend, so I don't have to describe this. You do? No. Uh, so this is an Indian legend where you have blind men that touch this elephant, and each one of them sees, I mean, touch uh, different parts of the elephant, and believe uh, for this one it's a snake, for this one it's a carpet, and so on. And you know they have all different interpretation of what this complex object is, and they start fighting. And there is a wise person that comes and say, well, if only you could talk together and you could put all the information you have together, you might have a chance to understand better the reality uh, that is facing all of you. And you know, you can, in English you say, there is an elephant in the room, but there is lots of elephants <laughs> <laughs> around, and, and we always have this sort of uh, individual blindness. And so how do we uh, manage to, to work on this, knowing that collective stupidity clearly also exists, because um, you can manipulate others uh, quite easily uh, in these sorts of games as well. Um, and so you could also say that you know, different disciplines are very good at watching one part of the elephant. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons for antidisciplinarity is for this ability to integrate more dimensions of any complex problem. So if you look at only you know, a single atom or a single bacteria, you may not need uh, so many disciplines, but even a single bacteria, you can attack it from physics, you can attack it from biology, from evolution, from all sorts of dimensions. Uh, one of the important dimensions uh, is, of course, this ability to document and share and being able to climb on the shoulders of giants so that you can see further. Okay? So uh, how do you make sure that you know, the education system uh, is doing this as much as the scientific world is doing? Not that the science is perfect in the way we publish and, and we share information, mm -hmm. but at least you know, that helps us to build uh, a lot of collective uh, work. And, uh, but in the education, it's not uh, yet at, at the center of, of the way things work. Uh, and so, you know, this open source spirit of documenting what you do is, is sort of obvious for many of us, but not for most of the education system. And so clearly knowledge is in somewhat in a transition because it used to be limited by physical boundaries and it had all sorts of characteristics that you knew in terms of how would you acquire knowledge, create knowledge, act knowledge, uh, and eventually update locally the knowledge. And today with digital technology, you can uh, have uh, just-in-time learning, uh, you can have all sorts of ways to um, work on having a, a laboratory around you. You know, a cell phone has more, um, not only computing power than as I used to go to the moon, but also more um, sensors that most labs had for most of the history of physics, for instance. Okay. Uh, and so this can empower every one of us to realize we have a laboratory in our pocket. So one of the, of the physics... Uh, person that has just joined us, Joël Chaubrier, uh, starts his physics course by saying, please switch on your cell phone. We're going to uh, use the accelerometer and all the, the digital sensors that are present in the cell phone to measure all sorts of physics. Okay, so you all have a laboratory in your pocket. Okay? And so given this, the sort of the world is becoming a laboratory. So we can gather data uh, on about everything, everywhere, uh, whenever we want. And so that is, it used to be that you know, knowledge in the sort of the scientific knowledge could be produced only in a laboratory that had expensive equipment. And this is still true for, say, uh, the X boson. If you want to, to handle the X boson, you, you have to go to the cell and you have to put a lot of resource uh, to have a chance to see uh, some. But lots of measures can be completely distributed, and that is a big change. Um, and the way we acknowledge it used to be that only institutions were you know, giving you a diploma. Universities have been quite good at that game, uh, of generating a sort of a monopoly around this. But today, you know, uh, there's also sort of open badges, I'm sure you know these things, and uh, that can be uh, spreading very, very fast, and also the alternative forms of recognition. Um, and of course, this can uh, be shared at, at all scale. <coughs> um, so I mean, I guess you, you've seen these sorts of things uh, throughout The Economist and others uh, in terms of you know, the most jobs being displaced and, or replaced, etc. Uh, maybe you all know this graph, which is somewhat interesting, is the numbers of years people have spent in school uh, from 1870 to 2010 in four different countries. Um, the first one that was the most educated in 1870 had on average only one year of schooling, it was Britain. 
Okay, and by now, um, in, in Korea, it was already more than 12 years in 2010. It's probably already one or two more years now. Uh, and that's on the average um, years of formal schooling. Uh, and it's, it keeps impro improving. Uh, but is it improving fast enough compared to uh, the way machines learn? Uh, and, and do we need just a quantitative increase or do we need a qualitative increase? Uh, that's the sort of question yeah. that I think is, is uh, time to I think uh, you need different kind of skills. You need much less factual knowledge and much less critical and uh, creative thinking. Yes, more. Thinking for yourself yes. rather than just taking in information. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, and, and you probably do constant learning actually. Okay. So, and uh, as scientists, for us, it's normal to see like this. But, you know, more and more jobs are starting to look like this because you always have. <laughs> not only to look for existing knowledge, but maybe to create new knowledge. And that's something for which you know, we've been trying, but that's not the case of the average person unless you know, they've had the chance of getting the sort of children uh, education that I was and describing. And scientists are not officially taught this. They, they are taught to think for themselves by looking at how other scientists do it. They don't really get courses into thinking. Yes. And that's one of the things that we were thinking about here at our university, to start a program on thinking making people think, teaching them how to think. The, the, interestingly, there is a, a program in Columbia University, I don't know if you had a look at it, uh, on ignorance. Okay? Which is, uh, you know, the sort of the other facets of, of thinking and knowledge. Uh, what is ignorance and why do we need ignorance and how can we, you know, uh, how do you know about things you don't know? Okay? Uh, and <laughs> And there is everything we don't know that we don't know as well. You know? And so how do we uh, think about these issues? Is, uh, so we have it should be an important part of our program too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The and it's a form of ignorance. Yeah. So it's uh, an important uh, yeah. part. And, and being able to you know, push the frontiers of knowledge and ignorance uh, yeah. 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 is a very interesting place to be, actually. Yeah. Okay. And that's very motivating. And that's one of the things that the kids that we train really like is when they realize that adults don't have the answer, and that, but they are allowed to look for the question, for the answer themselves. Yeah. Uh, and eventually, some of them do find an answer that no adults knew, like, you know, Rebrail Braille uh, was doing. And, and that's sort of, you know, uh, some, some sort of uh, an adventure that they really look for, forward to. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Heckman, he's an economist, maybe some of you uh, know him, he's a Nobel Prize winner and he's, he has uh, published that sort of curves and typically he's looking at the return uh, per dollar invested uh, when you invest on children of different age and typically the younger the better okay? and yet we do spend much less, at least in France, I don't know here on uh, kindergarten or pre-kindergarten uh, and the way we train the people in charge of pre-kindergarten in France is you know, below high school level uh, the way we pay them is, you know, the lowest possible pay, uh, and and the way we do research on, you know, what they should know and how they should be working is also uh, as minimal as as can be, and and that's stupid because that's where the highest returns of investment are, and so if we invest a lot on of the R and D on AI and so little on the R and D and human intelligence, then you know we'll probably. Uh, have more and more problems in the future. So that's um, another perspective. They on the same. Measure the return so they, they did experiments where they basically compare no program or basic programs to advanced program where children were hearing uh, more words per day, where they were having a better care, and so on. And then they looked at what happened to those uh, where they had done random uh, trials around this 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. Okay. And they concluded uh, that the numbers of years you will spend in prison, the numbers of unemployment years you will have, the, the salary you will get, and so on, would be very different. Okay. And so that's this way they measure the economic return on those dollars invested in a better pre-kindergarten or better uh, early school uh, period. That's the sort of ways they, they got these curves. Of course, it's not as smooth as this. Okay. This is uh, yeah. his own perspective on his own data. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can go back to the original uh, and be somewhat critical about this, but that's, that's an interesting lesson anyway. Um, 
this is only my only slide in French, I guess, but um, I don't know if you ever had uh, polls like this in, in, in Belgium. But uh, in France, uh, a couple of years ago, we asked <laughs> to kids whether they want the French education system to be reformed. And the answer was yes to 95%. <laughs> So only 4% were uh, fully satisfied um, with the way it worked. Um, and you know, some of them wanted to do tabula rase, which is you know, tabula rasa, they just wanted to erase everything. Uh, and that's this 26%. Uh, those wanted a deep reform, 50% more. And 90% some marginal reform, okay? but they still wanted some reform. It seems biased because you have three yes votes, whereas only two no votes, so there is it seems to me that if there no, are no, this is not, not, not there's only one, but you're right. So, but, but ça, ça, ça fonctionne globalement bien. Okay, so this works globally well. Yeah, but uh, I mean, the way you present an interview, it's very important the design or how you ask the questions and you propose the answers. I, I, you have, I, I, yeah, I would, I would love to have, I would love to have more experiments and more polls like this. The thing is, we never ask the young people what they want. This is the only poll that ever asked that question. <laughs> so it might be a biased <laughs> one, but that's the only one. It's we probably have. for the purpose also. <laughs> people in school. This is uh, age 15 to 30. So ah, some okay, of them so are yeah, in yeah, school, so some yeah, of them are just out of school. Oh, yeah. I think in Belgium, at least in the, the Flemish part, <coughs> you would get very different results. I think we have had quite a lot of reforms, and people are kind of thinking, well, actually, it works pretty well. So. We really need another reform. But it'll be interesting to compare. Yeah. I, I, I would love to have a world map yeah. uh, and know if Finnish kids, for instance, are truly happy. Uh, because you know, it's it's one thing that adults believe that the children should be happy. It's another that you know the children would declare themselves to be happy. Um, and um, and then you know, if you ask them if they want you know tabula rasa, you know what else do they want? Okay, uh, and that's not obvious if you don't ask them. And, and, and so France is very good at doing reforms, but we never ask the children what they want or, or if they like what we offer them. And, and so it's unclear that you know, uh, reforms are necessarily improving these numbers if you are not co-designing the reforms with the people that are receiving uh, the benefits of, of it. Um, so this is just one example of the Saventurier program I was showing you. Um, it's typically... Um, you can see kids uh, working together, together with different types of adults uh, in the same room. The teacher is here in the background, but you can see many other people are here. Some of them are artists, some of them are scientists, and they are you know, all working with children, um, trying to, uh, and also you've got groups of children working together and learning from one another. And that's quite typical in these sorts of class. Um, and uh, for instance, one of the interesting questions the kids were raising is, uh, are we allowed to question? Okay. Because you know, in French we say like curiosity is a villain default. In English you say curiosity kill the cat. I don't know what you say in Dutch. Mm. Probably you are encouraging curiosity more, and you don't have such a bad way of describing <laughs> curiosity. Curiosity kill the cat. Like curiosity is a villain default. Yeah, you've been too nieuwsgierig for your for your own best wel. There's not really a saying. Uh, so that's that's why that, that's why you are more inquiry-based uh, civilization. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's probably better for you. Uh, but you know, these kids were asking themselves that very question to begin with. Okay, and some of their parents were telling them that it was bad to ask questions, and you know, scientists were telling them the opposite, and they realized that you know, on the ants lab that they had in in their uh, class, they could ask all the questions uh, they wanted, uh, but that's that's uh, an interesting uh, perspective that you have to fight, at least in some places and in some families, still today, uh, for the right to ask questions. Um, and then you know, interestingly, so it's strange to me. Honestly, I mean, education is the first thing you want your pupils to do to ask questions. Yeah, but I think this is due to the to the critical age of uh, four years, or that. Actually, most kids are learn to inhibit their, their yeah. will to question and everything. Of course, your daughter, uh, she, you have answers to most questions or <laughs> too many questions, so you don't experience this. But most parents, they just can't answer the question: Why is the sky blue? No idea. Why uh, is this? Uh, uh, has this uh, cloud this shape? Why is this? Uh and parents will like, kind of 
Uh, they they will get them, angry like, like, they, because yeah. they don't, uh, they can't answer. Uh, yeah. In French, you say that savoir and pouvoir, que uh, savoir et pouvoir ça rime, et donc uh, si on admet qu'on ne sait pas, on va perdre son pouvoir. Okay. Um, and so the, the, the teacher of my six-year-old, uh, you know, after two weeks in class, she told me, you know, he's such a nice kid. Please. And then she said, but he's asking questions. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not see a little, uh, well, I'm sorry, but that's true, okay? And that's, that's what uh, drove me from bacteria to yeah, education. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that, you know, I want to question an education system where children cannot question. Yeah, um, you're very right about that. I mean, that I'm sure wouldn't be a problem here when children ask questions in the class. Yeah, that's what yeah. teachers are for, to answer questions. To they? me, this sounds very familiar, like being educated in Poland. Like asking a question is impolite, challenging the teacher, trying to show that the teacher doesn't know, you know, things like that. So, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. there is also a taboo on the copy, copying. It's a, it's a basis of uh, learning. Stop by copying things. Yeah. It's a taboo. Yes, and that's why, you know, uh, I, when I talk about the learning society, I say, you know, the learning class is a class where when a kid has learned something, another kid could be learning the same thing more easily because they would be encouraged to uh, share their knowledge and, you know, maybe copy on one another and, and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and typically, this is a taboo, at least, in, again, in this, you know, uh, past system that we still have, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that was designed uh, not to let people think, but to uh, basically select those that will be part of the elite uh, and will still be obedient, uh, and others that you know may not be obedient enough or not bright enough to be accepted within the, the elite. Uh, so the French system was clearly designed for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Still, uh, the copying leads to a much shallower learning. Like, uh, if you show me uh, a mathematical proof, uh, it's not the same as if I had found the proof myself. No, but peer-to-peer -peer learning can be very efficient, which is different from copying. Okay. Okay. Uh, and and you know, in France in the 19th century, we had a, an interesting system that was not enough controlled by the church, so it got uh, uh, closed eventually. But uh, where they had up to 200 kids for one teacher, wow. and so the one teacher could not cope with all of those kids. And so he was training only the most advanced ones that were training the youngest one that were training the youngest <laughs> one that were training the youngest one. So you had this pyramid of uh, learning and, and tutoring and mentoring among children. And they were learning three times faster. But they were not learning to respect authority. Maybe you know the... And they were involved in revolution and so on, so... France <laughs> 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 basically destroyed them. Yeah. There is a book about this now. Yes. Uh, is it called me Mutuelle. L'école mutuelle, une école trop efficace, c'est ça le sous-titre ah. mm -hmm. uh, One of our colleagues, uh, Vixel, uh, he wanted to teach a class of also 200 students and he invented a similar method, but he developed a software system for it so that the one could evaluate the other one. And exactly. Uh, yeah, and Pierre Collet is doing the same thing in Strasbourg. And ah, Pierre several Collet, uh, he has been ah. here. Yeah, yeah. So several people are, are designing stuff like this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for some reason they don't scale, or they are not, you know, uh, spreading as fast as you could imagine. That's you know, yeah. you could say that Socrates had invented the importance of questioning. I think the system of PR color should be able to scale. I think it's I completely agree, and so that's we we are just uh, about to try to help Pierre to convince the French higher education system to spread his system mm -hmm. uh, across the, the country, because I really do think that he has a wonderful uh, system. But it's yeah. not open source, isn't it? No. Well, uh, he uh, said it was Poland. I mean, yeah, but uh, his philosophy seems very open. Yeah. But then Victorus wanted to look it up, and he found nothing about it. No code or so. He's not so. I mean, maybe he has some plans. I don't know uh, mm. what you want. Uh, to I don't know it. whether it's uh, uh, whether it's intentionally not open so or maybe yeah, he has the, 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 the effort to, to document enough. it and everything. That was yeah, my impression. Maybe, maybe. Uh, mm. We don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very good point. I mean, and clearly, you know, you have to be open in all those dimensions. Okay, certainly you have to be open about your code, you have to be open about these processes and, and so on. And that's one of the rate limiting steps is that we don't have the resource to document what we do, we don't have, you know, uh, recognition for being innovative teachers, you know, we have um, and my point is that if we wanted to, to scale, I mean, the first step is to make this effort to, to make it public. We, that's obviously yeah. true. So, you know, I'll, I'll, next time I'll talk to him, I'll, I'll, I'll push in that direction. 
Oh, um, we actually had check. ideas in that style quite a while ago. We called it Steve Merge University of a kind of a global system uh, like that. But yeah, then we moved in different directions. But is so this still well? Still if at the if, back if, of if you if you want to push for this, I think this is really uh, at least something we want to push for. Uh, and we want to uh, connect this to actually this very uh, poster uh, on the uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And we would like to have a sort of a challenge-based university where students are invited to go for those challenges and use this sort of, uh, you know, ants uh, type of strategy uh, to explore uh, the numbers of possibilities and, and tell it to open source uh, all of the local solution because some of the local solution could then spread. Uh, so that's the sort of uh, uh, digital backbone we'd like to build um, to contribute to redesign university from inside and also to help people that don't have access to universities, typically in Africa and many other places. Um, and, or, and also people that are you know, lifelong learners. So we do have to build uh, uh, an alternative digital uh, framework because the, the current system is not evolving and it's not adaptable, uh, uh, especially compared to the AI robotics and, and so on right now. Uh, what do you think of a system like uh, the Khan Academy? Well, the Khan Academy has some interesting dimension, uh, including you know the lots of learning analytics and, and so on, but it's not an open system. Uh, and you know it's only uh, Salman Khan that produced the video, and you know etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you allows him to know that he has the quality control, but you know it lacks all sort of these open uh, dimensions that, for me, are are not uh, yeah. necessarily the best. And which makes the difference as Wikipedia shows between a system that can go to encompass everything and a system that remains limited to a few people who want to put in the effort. Um, I don't know if you know this young man, but it's it's about uh, the same spirit, but uh, in the third world, where sort of you could double leapfrog frog on, on different dimension. So uh, it's called uh, Ali Baba, and when he was 15, the BBC and CNN made reports on what he was doing, and saying he was the youngest school principal in the world. And uh, in fact, he opened his school when he was eight. And it's very much what we were discussing about Ecole Mutuelle, because he was rich enough, barely rich enough to go to school, but his friends were not. So when he came back home, he started to tell what he had learned mm -hmm. that day to four of his friends. And when the BBC came, there were 1,500 children uh, in the backyard of his uh, uh, parents uh, learning together in that sort of uh, peer-based uh, system. No digital tools, no nothing. Okay? So you know, they are in the open like this. So there is, uh, I mean, some of you work more on organizations and, and their evolution than myself, but there is a lot of uh, research in, in uh, companies, organization, on you know, how do you make them learning organization, and how do you make them more fluid, etc. Uh, so I won't spend much time on this. So we, we made proposal for this learning society to the French government, and uh, now we are trying to refine them because we change governments, and they interestingly ask us to, to follow this. But basically, you know, there is, I'll try to go fast on these proposals unless you want me to go deep into it because some of it might be obvious already implemented in a country like yours. But you know, self-reflexivity is missing, especially in teachers, in children, and, and you want to have more professional development and you want to base it on you know, the best possible research, which we don't do in France. Um, you want uh, the French <coughs> teachers are the one that collaborate the least, um, and the French kids also. Okay. And so our education system is not, uh, we are uh, lots of pressure for competition, not enough for collaboration. And, uh, and so you could be collaborating uh, to do all sorts of things, including uh, to research new topics. You could bring lots of different disciplines together to do this. You know, in France, we tend to oppose education science to cognitive science, to digital science, to all this. You know, and again, in this, um, so we are pretty good at, at looking at the elephants in, in different ways, but not putting together the, the big picture. Um, you probably know about fab labs and third places and so on. Uh, they start to open in French schools and French universities, but it's relatively recent and, and should be more encouraged. And especially you really being truly open to the whole community locally. So there is a nice example in France uh, where they put a fab lab into a place for uh, handicapped children. And, and so it's in the room that is dedicated to these children. 
And if the others want to use it, they have to come in that room. And they have to, if they want to learn how to use the 3D printer, they have to learn it from the children that are this handicap. Okay. So suddenly they become the only ones that have access to some advanced knowledge. And so everybody else wants to go there. And so you know, suddenly they become you know, sort of the elite place where everyone wants to be, okay. I including some of the local companies that don't have access to free printing <laughs> and so on. And so local companies come and then offer them internship and it's basically changed the, uh, it's called inverted uh, inclusion. It's sort of a, an interesting uh, model like you have inverted classrooms. Mm -hmm. Excellent idea. It's called Fabulous if you're looking for it on the web. And uh, of course there are lots of digital third places these days, but all of them are proprietary, or most of them are proprietary. And you don't have a good public service uh, that would be uh, created around this. And so that's part of the things we're trying to think of. One of the things that is basically the same as your stigma university, or at least that's my impression of where I stand from, is how do we build knowledge map? And how do we have a sort of Google map of knowledge where your own trail would be uh, kept uh, in a very private way where your uh, privacy would be respected, but maybe you would get offers of, oh, if you have gone through that path, maybe you want to explore that new path. Yeah, okay. exactly. And you have recommendation system where you can start meeting people yeah. and you can start going to places. And if you want to go from where you are to where you want to be, uh, like on a Google map, you could know how long it will take you and what would be the fastest route to go from what you know to what you would want to know. Yeah. Okay? And that might be a new job opportunity or, and, and so on. Okay? So we're really trying to uh, design uh, these sorts of uh, digital tools uh, and convince the, the French governments that you know, this could this should be uh, a public service, uh, but not a bureaucracy. So if you see the <laughs> difference, uh, uh, <laughs> friends know how to build bureaucracy. Uh, uh, and that requires standards and uh, evolving, what I call evolving forms of freedom. So very much like Lego, you know, all these pieces can self-assemble because they have uh, a well-standardized uh, system, and so you want to have digital pieces that have, you know, open API and, and will allow the interoperability between what you would be learning in the various platforms. Okay, it should all end in your personal portfolio, and you should be able to take it across countries, across all sorts of institutions, whether they are public or private, uh, digital or physical, and you should be able to keep all this. And and the frames of freedom should be evolving, which you know, in France, it's sometimes a fight. That when you talk about friends of freedom, they believe that it's either frame or freedom, and um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know you have to to explain these sorts of concepts. Um, we say that you need a lot of ethics. Um, I'm sure you know some of you must know uh, epistemic name phonesis, or should I explain I it? I don't remember what phonesis was. Uh, the other one I know, yeah. So this is the three forms of knowledge according to Aristotle. And episteme is knowing the world, techne is knowing how to act upon the world, and phronesis is the ethics of action. And interestingly, we know more about episteme and techne, and we grew exponentially episteme and techne, but we didn't grow exponentially uh, uh, phronesis. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, there is even some experiments, I don't know in Belgium, but in some places where people take the time to measure these things, um, they've shown that the level of ethics go down with the numbers of years in a technical university. Yeah, uh, there are these famous experiments that if you take economic students in a kind of prisoner dilemma kind of games, they go down. They're much the more selfish than yes. people who are not <laughs> care, studying economics. And, and, but, but it's not true when they enter. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's not a, a selection bias. It's really yeah, a, yeah. an education they bias. They learn to be selfish. And, and they've shown that the emotional intelligence uh, and empathy go down in medical school. Yes. Yes. Really. Ooh. Wow. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> you see that <laughs> we tend to promote epistemic and technique, not much those other dimensions that uh, actually will make a difference uh, in the world of robots. Because, yeah. you know, uh, that's so we have to work on, on, on uh, this. Sort of I mean, I have always a kind of a mixed feelings when I hear people speaking about ethics because they don't always mean the same kind of things. There is what I, I would make a difference between values and between morals where morals is about constraining, about rules, about what you shouldn't do, and values is about being able to distinguish of all the different things, the ones that are more valuable or less valuable. And that part is put much less under this. People are merely saying, oh, but is it moral to clone, or is it moral to, like, there is some kind of a sharp boundary that you shouldn't cross, 
and then ethics is about not crossing the boundaries, but it's not so much about not doing certain negative things, but knowing what the positive things are, and that people don't know. Yeah. And, and questioning what you do, and, and yeah. questioning the implications of what you do. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think that those things are not present enough in education in general, but we don't have, for, but we, for instance, have an ethics medical committee. We don't have uh, an ethical committee on AI yet, uh, and we don't have an ethic committee on education and on, you know, is it good to change education or not? Okay. Um, and so I think, you know, we should, uh, at some point, um, have, have all sorts of uh, ethical uh, considerations. Um, this is a slide that is maybe not very uh, readable, but it's the question is, what is a learning territory? Okay. And, and typically, on a given territory, there's a lot of different institutions. There's those that take care of the youngest one, those that take care of schools, and then dropouts, and then you know universities, and then uh, unemployment, and so on. And but on a given territory, uh, the the weakest ones tend to go and to fail when they change institutions, and they tend to be lost, and they tend to uh, be dropped out, and, and so on. And and so the question is, what can be done on a given territory so that everyone you know, you know, basically this African proverb that says you need a, a village to raise a, chair, a child. So I think we need something like this. We need to bring together all of the uh, actors to discuss together what can be done to truly help everyone on the territory and learn uh, the various institutions should be learning together and, and, and co-designing um, program with the, the youngest ones. Um, so that's sort of a, a call uh, for collaboration. Um, and we believe that you need an open research alliance uh, uh, for these things. Uh, one of the things um, we would really like to have in the future is, I guess you all know the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change. Uh, we believe we need a sort of international panel for learning change. Okay. So in the age where machines learn, uh, and we invest so much money there, but so little on the way we learn, uh, this is going to be rate limiting for the well-being of most people, and and so we believe that you know the same way the climate is influencing all of us, the arrival of AI and robots and so on is going to influence all of us, uh, and it's going to happen probably faster than we anticipated, say, ten or twenty years ago, and uh, so we probably have to get together and bring you know open science and open data and open discussions with you know, the best possible experts coming from all the disciplines that seem that they have something to contribute. And uh, also, uh, ideally, a citizen science uh, perspective to this. Uh, and I don't know if you know any citizen science project on learning. And I don't understand why. Okay? I mean, I know citizen science of health, I know citizen science of biodiversity, I know citizen science of astrophysics, or many dimensions. But I don't understand why we don't have citizen science of learning. Because that's one of the easiest things that everybody knows about. Okay? Uh, so we should be able to answer, you know, what is the most important thing you've been learning in the last year? Every one of us can answer that question. It's not an easy question, but you know, you it's good the, to reflect on this. You need a paradigm for that. You need kind of some example questions and example ways of measuring. And everybody knows us for physics and for chemistry and so on, but for education, uh, it's much less well known. I think it's it's in general like that that uh, the citizen science paradigm is like from strict science, right? Not so much like social science. Well, it's yeah. it's uh -huh. it's not so true. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Mapiness, for instance. Mm -hmm. So Mapiness is um, an app that's been designed by the London School of Economics uh -huh. to map happiness, happiness. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh -huh. And so Mapiness is uh, an app. If you install it on your phone, you'll be uh, pinged on an irregular mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. to cover all the uh, moments that are possible. Yeah. Yes, and they ask you, mm -hmm. okay. are you happy today? Yeah, uh, on a zero to 10 scale. Mm -hmm. okay? And what's interesting is the variation, clearly. And what they see is that um, the quality of the landscape around you influence how happy you declare you are. Okay? Uh, the time of the week also, you know, uh, people tend to be happier on weekends. And the happiest day in the year is typically Christmas, at least in Britain, where they measure this. Um, and, and so you, know, you, you can start can asking these sorts of questions, and then you can say, OK, is it good to work on weekends? Is it good to um, you know, destroy the, the park uh, that is in the middle of the city to build uh, value for you know, a few people that mm -hmm. will be living there? And so on. So you could be asking these sorts of questions and take collective decisions. So in fact, it's, it's more the creativity 
uh, of the social scientist or the any scientist, you know, in terms of being able to, to address this. You have, for instance, a project I, I, I sort of liked, which is um, you can uh, see what type of cars do not respect traffic lights. And people have, you know, make pictures and, and, and so on, and they've shown that biggest cars tend not to respect traffic lights. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's all sorts of little things you can do. You see what I mean? Um, and it's more, you know, uh, can you ask a good question? Yeah, and can you invite the community to address that question together? So do you have any program already uh, for a proposal of citizen science about, um, about education? So one of the things we, we, we want to launch is uh, um, a festival to celebrate learning. Okay. Um, and the idea is to invite everyone to reflect on what is the most relevant thing you've been learning in the last year. Okay. And then to celebrate it, and not only to celebrate your own learning, but to celebrate the people that help you to learn, the places that help you to learn, uh, maybe the methods that help you to learn, or it could be books, it could be videos, it could be games, it could be you know your grandmother, it could be your little niece, it could be you know uh, whatever. Okay, your gym uh, where you suddenly have learned to do a sport that you never thought you would be able to, or whatever. Okay? And it's for you to decide. And the idea is to make this learning festival a week long, so you can celebrate what you typically do on Monday morning, what you typically do on Tuesday afternoon, or uh, Sunday evening, or any time in between. Uh, and and you could. Uh, Progressively map, you know, all sorts of activities that you have that are typically regular activities um, that happen during that week. Uh, so that's that's one way. And if everyone answers through an app, you know, what is the most relevant learning they've been doing at these various points, then you start getting interesting data on, you know, what are considered relevant learning for all sorts of people of all ages and different regions and, and so on. So that's that's for me an interesting thing we are discussing with. Uh, Someone called Lee Hartwell, who is, uh, happens to be a Nobel Prize winner in medicine, um, but has a strong interest for these sorts of questions. But you know, there is another thing we could do. I don't know if you're familiar with John Hattie. So John Hattie is uh, the Jonathan one. Jonathan Hyde. Sorry? Jonathan Hyde. No, no. H Hattie. H A W T I E. And. Um, and uh, so he's the one that they that did a, a, one of the most cited uh, paper on education science, which is a meta-analysis of the meta-analysis, okay. mm -hmm. to know what is an impactful measure in a school system. Okay, is it cooperative learning? Is it you know digital tablets? Is it reducing the size of the class? Is it you know uh, all sorts of uh, questions that you could be asking? And he's shown that some of it had more impact than others, but he's done this once. Uh, and in a way that is closed, and, and you don't have access to the primary data. Uh, and so if you want to redo the analysis, add new data, you just can't do it. Okay? But you can typically do an open science approach to the same thing, invite uh, teachers and, and students that want to be teachers to read the primary literature, to extract the relevant data, to do this with redundancy so that you can check quality of what they provide, and progressively uh, create an open database uh, for these sorts of things. So I, mean, I think there is all sorts of paradigm that can be invented, uh, but uh, I'm just you know highlighting some, and we would like to have um, an open workshop uh, to discuss uh, this question and, and see what people can come up with together. Um, so that's the, what I was just saying. I see in science of learning. I mean, obviously you need international collaboration. It's sort of trivial. Um, you need funding at some point. Um, so interestingly, this is a, a learning president because he was citing, this is a quote from a 19th century US <laughs> president that a 21st century US president uh, was <laughs> taking. And you know, I'm trying to uh, show this uh, to politicians so that they can be learning politicians. You never know. <laughs> I, I don't think I need to push this to you. But uh, I don't know if you know, for instance, uh, uh, social impact bonds. So th those in terms, maybe you know, no. no? So uh, what I what I understand of it, because um, my understanding of this sort of things is very very small, is um, you have an investor that helps a social innovator uh, and gives them money to spread and scale their system, and the idea is there will be social values, social benefits for the community, and if the community uh, saves money thanks to these social benefits, then the 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 local community uh, officials would reimburse the investor. Mm. 
You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's that's a somewhat innovative uh, way of funding social innovation. Um, that can have a return on investment. Impact. It's maybe difficult to measure whether the savings were made because of the intervention. So that's why you have to randomize. I mean, you have to do all sorts of, of uh, relevant controls, and you know, more and more economists are getting better and better at at uh, convincing themselves uh, and others that you know there is some value in, in some of this approach. Um, so I mean, I think you also need this sort of uh, uh, strategy um, to do these things, and. Um, and it's just to say that, you know, obviously this has to be a, some sort of a collective effort and that, you know, all those that want to uh, come together uh, for these sorts of things are, are more than welcome. So thanks for your patience and questions. And if you have further questions, I'd be happy to discuss them. So it does uh, look quite a lot like what we were thinking of in terms of the Stigmergic University. The Stigmergic University was the idea that you would have this worldwide open access system where people could post educational materials and then others would be attracted to it, would be able to add to it, would be able to change it, and there would be some kind of a reputation system that would measure how good a particular piece is. But when we saw what Pierre Collet was doing, it was actually quite similar. So yes. it's maybe one of the reasons also why we were directing our attention afterwards in a different direction. Also because the two people who were most busy with it, Yavo uh, Kostov, and who left our group, and then uh, Mikhail Kieben, who was in the, in the meantime busy with his own company. So uh, that's why it, it's the idea a little bit kind of died out. But it, it, I think it was quite <coughs> similar. And Maybe Did you have anything written on it? or pick up some old texts of it, but we never really there developed is, there it. There is some PDF, I, I saw yeah, it. Uh, uh, we we never really of developed it up to the level yeah. where it was really ready to be published. But uh, For me, it's fascinating how difficult educational change is. Like, I, I think it's like the most difficult change in a society is education. And it's it's so puzzling because like it's, it's you know like everybody says of course we are like here to educate you of course we are here to prepare you for the world but but it's just a narrative and like uh, and in fact what is happening in educational systems like socialization for the outside system as it is and uh, and like it, like f for it to change the uh, it would have to resonate with the whole society differently because if uh, there's this uh, selection, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's I mean, I, I fully agree, and I, I'm, I'm still trying to understand conservatism because that's not uh -huh. something that is very natural to me. Uh, but um, there is some deep problem and some uh, signs of hope I, I'll try to share uh, in a few instances. So the the problems is typically in France we we have uh, Stockholm syndrome. Okay. So people have suffered uh, from schools and fall in love with them. Okay. And those that, have, where the school system say that they are the brightest, they don't want to change the school system because the system say they are the brightest. So they, this must be a good system because they say that you know, they are good. <laughs> so there is, uh, and some of them have become teachers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and they love so much the system that they decide to spend their whole life in it. Okay. Uh, and they don't even understand that you know, kids don't like schools because they did like schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I think there is a lot of inertia like this. And it's also that you know parents want the best for their children, and if it's the same as what they did, then they can help them. And if it's not the same as what they did, then they are sort of lost. And and, and so there is all sort of reason for people to be somewhat conservative. And there is one that uh, maybe you know uh, um, that you know I, I understood after reading Samuel Samuel Weiss, uh, Life. You know Samuel Weiss? So Samuel Weiss, uh, she must know. Yes. You want to tell the story of Samuel Weiss? He's the one in the 19th century who discovered that. Uh, was working in a maternity hospital and was suffering with diarrhea because of infections. And he was the one who discovered that washing your hands carefully mm -hmm. actually saved a woman, believe it. Uh, but no one believed him and he died. Uh, he was completely rejected from the medicine uh, universities and he died uh, at a new school. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Samuel Weiss was saying is that if you wash your hands, you will save life. And what his colleagues were hearing is for years we didn't wash hands and therefore yeah, okay, you know yeah. would kill people and they just didn't want to hear this yeah. and actually the only one that believed him committed suicide 
uh, because he realized that indeed he had killed even his beloved niece yeah. uh, exactly uh, after this. Okay. And so uh, for those of you that read French, um, uh, there is uh, The Life of Sam Advice was, um, was written by uh, Louis Ferdinand Céline in his own thesis of medicine. Oh. So this is, uh, this is at least the way uh, I've learned this story. And, uh, and I think that you know, this is somewhat the same. If you say to an educator, you know what? You could boost the creativity of children and their learning. It means that what they've done in the past might not have boosted creativity and learning. Okay? And so you're basically attacking them, uh, even w without wanting it. Okay? And so at least the way I'm trying to say this, because I don't want to end like some advice or or Socrates and, and, and you know, these sorts of guys that <laughs> we're pushing in the right direction that ended up badly. Um, I'm trying to say, well, let's say that you had the perfect system until yesterday, okay? But today the world is changing and tomorrow it's going to change even more, okay? And so in order to prepare for tomorrow, we have to start changing now, okay? And that starts from every one of us. None of us is perfect. Every one of us can, can learn. Every one of us can learn from others. Every one of us can contribute to research and, and, and be educated uh, through research. And, um, and so, you know, professional development is key. And so one of the things I, I learned while, you know, discussing with trade unions and parents and, you know, uh, politicians and inspectors and principals and, you know, we have 10 level of hierarchies in the education system in France. So you can imagine how agile the system is. Okay? <laughs> But progressively I talk to every level and I realize that everyone wants to change, but everyone else believes that it's the others that don't want. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's <laughs> that's strange. That's system. <laughs> and, and that's why you know this report is clearly not a perfect report, but interestingly it got lots of interesting feedback from very different people. Because you know, we were not saying, you know, you are the guilty one or you are the guilty one, but we were saying, you know, we should all uh, contribute to change, none of us uh, as the perfect solution, but all of us together can contribute to some change. Mm -hmm. And so mobilizing the collective intelligence and collective mm -hmm. effort on trying to change the system is at least the only strategy I could think of mm -hmm. that so far didn't uh, got strong antibodies and rejection uh, uh, so far. It's like very systemic, like uh, that if you see it in everybody but not in you, it's like in between us, in, in the relation. And, and this sort of, uh, you know, we say, we say this also, we worked a lot with trade unions, not only teacher trade unions, but also, you know, the general trade unions, uh, and we work with, you know, uh, what we call the MEDEF, which is the unions of companies, uh, heads and CEOs, and, uh, and everyone sort of agrees that, you know, given uh, AI arrival and, and so on, we have to change, we have to change lifelong learning for everyone, okay? So it's just, not just a kindergarten problem or, you know, like a high school problem, even though, you know, you have to fix uh, things, but you have to reach out this systemic approach and this cultural approach. And that's why I love this idea of the learning festival, which is not mine. It's done in Nokia, it's done in Singapore, it's done in various places. And um, because suddenly you can experience that learning festival uh, with your parents, with your children, with your friends, and, and, and it's the whole society can be involved into reflecting differently about what learning is and why we should be celebrating these new ways of learning. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I want to um, take the perspective from the politician. Uh, one of the goals of politics is to keep populations under control. So what do you think about the, the possible goal to keep uh, <laughs> our interest to keep a, a lowly educated uh, population? That's probably true, uh, but at least in some places, uh, in time and space, um, you have these sorts of uh, people, I mean, some people would believe like this, um, but in today's world where the economic uh, worth of a country depends on the education level of its people, you start having other forces. Uh, and, and so more and more companies are saying that they want creative workers uh, that can cooperate. Uh, and they don't say anymore we want standardized people that you know will all behave exactly the same way uh, after a competitive system. So it's interesting to see that you know uh, what you say basically you know Socrates was you know considered guilty for the very reason that you are declaring. Okay? Uh, but uh, I think that there is more and more forces in society that want to see change. Okay? And so if you're in a democratic society where even the companies have an interest in uh, this education change, I think that you know, if you start aligning more and more people's interests, including the youngest ones, um, 
you can hope for uh, at least some pockets of change. And then, you know, what I do hope is that this International Panel for Climate Change is addressing an issue that, you know, is very hard to understand. You know, what is climate? Why is it changing? You know, why do we care what's going to happen in 50 years? I mean, all these questions are very abstract. Uh, and yet, there was a collective scientific endeavor that managed to convince not everybody. We still have Donald Trump. We still have, you know, all sorts of people that don't want to hear about these things. But it's getting very hard, even for them, not to hear because one of the things politicians want is being re-elected. Okay? And if everybody understood that you know, there is a better way for their children, and most people want the best for their children, uh, then you, know, you, you start playing with other forces. So the forces you described do exist. I'm, I'm putting my emphasis on other sets of forces. Mm -hmm. But there is also um, other forces that push uh, the educational system towards business. Like in many countries, uh, education is, all, is, is a business, like in the US and UK, where the fees uh, in the university are so high that, that the student has to, to contract debt of uh, many years. Do you think uh, it's possible to find antibodies against that uh, tendency? Well, if you look at um, achievements uh, at uh, various level of uh, school age, university age, and also economy, uh, Scandinavian countries are a much more interesting country than uh, than the U.S., uh, for instance. Okay, uh, and and so there is ways that are more egalitarian, uh, where sort of everybody can succeed together, and and typically. Uh, in competitive countries, uh, the U.S. is money-based. France is based on you know your ranks in mathematics and these sorts of things. Uh, you <coughs> create lots of inequality. You know, France is one of the most unequal countries uh, among the OECD, uh, and and so I think that this creates all sorts of social problems. Uh, in in and um, and so everywhere you have tensions between you know those that have and those that don't have and those that would want to share better and others that would want to keep everything for themselves and so on. That's, that's true everywhere. But uh, I think international comparison tend to prove that more egalitarian, democratic, uh, open, collaborative system uh, tend to work better on all sorts of dimensions, including you know, sustainability, economy, well-being, and education. Uh, and so you can align these things. And, and if you have international comparisons uh, and data and you start documenting. So one of the things we're uh, trying to do with sort of citizen science of learning is we have a reform, for instance, of French high schools uh, that is in process for the next three years. And we started to discuss with high schoolers uh, that have been starting to discuss with some Belgian friends and some high, uh, Italian ones and Danish ones and American ones and Brazilian ones and so on. And through the web, uh, they build uh, a comparative study of what it is like. Okay? If you take, say, Erasmus, students and you ask them to map the diversity of European uh, education system and university system, you'll get very soon a map that is interesting. So in this 95% that don't want uh, what we have, you know, it would be interesting to see uh, what else do they want. You know, do they prefer the Belgian system or the, or the Finnish system or the Swiss system or, or whatever? You know, it will, it will, we could get um, data like this. And I think you know, um, it's easier to control a community that doesn't have access to the rest of the world. But we fortunately live in an open world where digital information is traveling very fast. And I think that's, that can contribute to a lot of change. Uh, I think we also have the advantage of the new technologies because the new technologies, on the one hand, they're good uh, arguments for people who don't want to change to say, well, but now with this new technology, we can do all these things that we couldn't do before, so let's try them out. Well, it's not necessarily the technology itself that makes a difference, but the fact that the technology suggests a more interactive, more open way of working, more collaborative way of working. So you can use it as a kind of a tool to change things because nobody can say nowadays that oh, we don't need computers, we don't need iPads, we don't need internet. Yeah, and I, I fully agree with this. But you know, still in France, there's people that would say, you know, it, there is an age when you don't need these things, you know. You, uh, we didn't have this when we were younger and we adapted, so you know, maybe your kids don't need it now. So you, you have some conservative parents and teachers and, and politicians um, uh, behind such movement. So what I'm trying to say is that you know, in the red queen world that I was describing initially, you know, in this world where AI is learning very fast, 
you the only way the only thing you can do is what machines can do typically computing memorizing and um, it's not the same as being able to ask new questions uh, and you know define what's meaningful typically what machines cannot do okay and so what is the meaning of life you know what's meaning Full for you as an individual is not thyself. I mean, all sorts of dimensions like this. That's um, exactly where I would like to go to have people ask new questions, the kind of questions that AI simply can't ask. Exactly. And that's what uh, I said before with, with the values. You were speaking about the phonesis. Uh, I, I, I call it the complexity of value. It's one of the problems in AI, it's that you can teach AI per, uh, programs to find patterns in very complex data, but these patterns, they are not values. They don't tell the AI what to do. They tell you that is a cat, and that is a person, and that is a, a girl lying on the lawn. But then what does it mean, a girl lying on the lawn? What should I do if I see a girl lying on the lawn? That they cannot learn. That's the much more complex part, and what people call ethics, as I said, tends to go too much towards the morals, the rules of what you shouldn't do. Well, the important thing is, what should I do? What are the useful things to do? It's what you might call wisdom rather than knowledge. So AI can learn to extract knowledge from data. They cannot yet learn to extract wisdom. The wisdom is the part of the values, the part of saying what is meaningful, what is important, how does it feed together, what, what should I do with my life? I, I'm sure you're familiar with T.S. Eliot's poem um, where he was saying, where is the life we've lost in living? Where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we've lost in information? And I think if we're here today, we'd say, where is the information we're losing in data? Yeah, okay. exactly. And, and so I, you know, my point, which is basically yours, is you know, uh, we have data technology. We have information technology. We don't have much for knowledge, and we have nothing for wisdom. And for life, you know, uh, for a meaningful life, we hardly have anything. And, and so, you know, how can we work on these things? And how can we sort of re reverse the, the poem of T.S. Eliot as sort of a research program? That would be my, you know, my ultimate research program would be T.S. Eliot uh, in reverse. Yep. And, uh, and I think that we start to think about, you know, what can be done, for instance, to develop if I would dare, um, maybe the, the word are not appropriate, but you know, just to give an image, uh, what would be Confucian technology? What would be Socratic technology? What would be Kantian technology? You know, can we take this you know, great philosopher of the past and think of you know, what, uh, can we take their ideas and their perspective uh, in, in the way we're trying to design things? I, I'll give you know, one example. Socrates was against the technology of his time. Uh, and yes, I think. Okay, he was against writing and painting, and, uh, and he was saying that you know, if you write, you don't know who's going to read you, and if you read, you cannot ask questions to the one that wrote, so that you know, those are not the technology that allows the dialogue and the debate, and therefore they are not uh, as good as you know, a good conversation. Uh, and clearly television is not very Socratic. Um, and uh, you know, Twitter is slightly more. Like YouTube, is. YouTube is one of the biggest phenomenons in the last year has been debate response videos where people remix and rematch each other's videos and it becomes a dialogue. Yes, and so, you know, I think we are inventing, and the communities are empowering themselves in, in inventing their own tools for new public uh, forms of debate. And, and I think we do need this because, you know, we've got Trump and fake news and all these sort of things, so we have to reinvent these things. And uh, one of those things we are going to try with, uh, you know, the French newspaper called Le Monde, uh, we are going to try to... Um, uh, find movies that move people and help them to think about you know, their inner uh, emotions and the way they relate to some change in the world. Okay. And it could be a movie about AI or a movie about you know, whatever uh, subject that uh, we would care to uh, collectively debate. But the idea is to have a sort of uh, uh, debates after seeing the movie that is shared uh, in a fractal way so you could organize uh, a debate one-on-one -on -one, or you could organize one in your class or in your university or in your city and, and you could be sharing uh, what you find uh, collectively uh, through the web. Okay? And so you could reinvent the art of debate um, and you could you know, open source, mismatched and, uh, and remix uh, all this. So I think we need to invent uh, new processes. So what we're trying to do, basically, uh, in the Cree, um, 
is to be a small part of the world where people that care about these issues can come together, discuss it, and get recognized for the time they spend on doing these sorts of things. So we give you know bachelor, master, PhD. We give you know some research grants uh, to uh, sabbaticals and, and and people that want to come for a postdoc or something uh, if they are interested in addressing these questions. That's that's you know we try to build our own little uh, uh, niche. <laughs> where we are allowed to ask uh, questions and to take the time to ask those questions and to ask it collectively and especially involving the youngest ones. Uh, and we, we try to build on, you know, on a regular basis, we add new dimensions to it. So, uh, you know, we have a fab lab for long, we have a VR lab, we have a game lab, we have a MOOC factory, we are building a sports uh, lab uh, for studying movement and emotions. Uh, and, um, and add you know, all sorts of romantic reality dimensions to it. We are creating a baby lab uh, as well to uh, try to have the children um, uh, be as welcome as possible within our facilities as well. Okay. So we're trying to you know, have a, an uh, integrative systemic perspective on these sorts of change and uh, allowing people to address the various dimensions of their life uh, together rather than, you know, I think to segment it to to get recognized for whatever achievements in some hyper specialized uh, niche. And all this on the connection with the evolutionary transitions. Yeah, so I think you know that those are one more reason to mobilize the collective intelligence. So what I'm, I'm truly deeply interested in is basically the, the co evolution between the human intelligence and the artificial intelligence between the intelligence of individuals and the intelligence of the collective. And so what can we do to uh, integrate uh, those dimensions? And, you know, uh, for instance, can you imagine uh, uh, a digital mentor? You know, what is mentoring? And can, can uh, an AI help mentor uh, people? Because, I mean, I, I would love to have, you know, top mentors for everyone, but so far they seem to be a rather scarce resource. Have you seen the video of Digital Aristotle? No. I sent that to you. It's, a, it's a, uh, the, I the idea that a model for education in the future is that everyone will basically be able to have a personal Aristotle as a lifelong mentor. And so basically it's the idea that Alexander the Great personally had an Aristotle to teach him while he was growing up, one one on one, basically, but that you know, with the with the the demand for universal education and the rise in the the the, the rise in the the unstable balance between good teachers and large classroom sizes, that this is gonna this is gonna reach some some critical critical capacity that it can't it can't. Uh, can't continue into the next meta system transition, and so that they'll have they'll have to be some union between what's going on between online education and machine learning and artificial intelligence to try to develop hyper personalized software for each student, and that basically you would be able to have a one on one relationship with the most intelligent possible knowledge systems that that. Basically, you'll have the, the whole weight of human history and knowledge behind you and in relationship with each developing individual. And then the, then the consequences of that <coughs> feedback process would be what well, would be a singularity, wouldn't it? It would be certainly an interesting uh, transition to, to watch. Uh, one of the, I mean, I, so we're, we're starting to, to work on the same lines. Um, and so I'd be quite interested to see, you know, the way they, they were framing their arguments and and and, um, and the discussions around it. But what we are probably going to start with is how do you mentor mentors, mm -hmm. uh, and which is a somewhat easier target because there is probably uh, less frailty uh, in an adult mentor than in, you know, that needs that nevertheless needs mentoring. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll just maybe argue a little about this. Then if you start with the very young ones and give them only you know, the best possible AI to interact with them because you know, they still probably need human-to-human -human interactions uh, as part of their uh, normal development, 
uh, before we know exactly what the perfect AI uh, uh, mentor would be uh, for the youngest one. So I, I'd rather start with the... the, in, the that, in that transition, the, the documentary about the, the, fin the Finnish phenomenon is interesting, but... Uh, the, 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 the way in which the way in which the, the, the teacher's role changes in this transition is I think crucial to, to mediate that, that balance yes and, and so you know how do you help teachers evolve uh, so professional development of teachers as I was describing is a way limiting step you know most countries that like Finland change their education system uh, put professional development at the heart of it you know in France we don't invest in it so we have a system that doesn't evolve and doesn't work and um, <clears throat> but you're so not really critical of France. No, I'm, I'm just you're you know I'm just taking numbers. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you look at the, at the latest polls and, and they will uh, or the latest uh, Pearl's data or PISA data. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be as objective as I can. So um, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think you know what's interesting is is to be uh, not only critical but constructive in the criticism you make. Uh, and French are somewhat good at critical, constructive, not always. Uh, <laughs> and um, so w what I'm trying to say is uh, for instance in France teachers like actually many care profession uh, many profession of people that care about others uh, like you know nurses doctors and uh, you know parents to some extent and, and uh, uh, helpers uh, if you have older parents and so on uh, all those people are suffering a uh, lot of stress. Okay? So French teachers have a very high rate of burnout. Okay? Uh, young students in medicine have a high rate of burnout. So we are very good at burning out uh, people <laughs> that care about ours. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, they it's end up here being less empathy uh, after a while. And, and it's also true that you know, those jobs where you have to help others, and it's not so easy first to help, and second, you might not be well trained, and you might not always be able to help. And so you feel bad if you know you dedicate your life to help and you don't manage to help. Uh, and and so, and especially if you take teachers again, you know, the world is changing fast. Schools are changing fast. Children are changing fast. We are integrating a, a bigger diversity of children in classes. And if you're not trained teachers to do more than their discipline, uh, and they don't know you know how to handle diversity of children. And, and so on, then you know they're going to be stress for the children and for the, the, the teacher in the class. And if the teachers were better trained and trained to train themselves, trained to relax, trained to maybe relax the children around them, uh, there would be a better uh, atmosphere in the class and they will feel better. And so we believe that this is the sort of things for which you could develop a mentoring uh, app, okay. sort of chatbot. And the idea, and I don't know if you've seen, but there is uh, some, I mean, for me it came out as a surprise, but uh, there is interesting uh, psychological chatbot. Have you seen those? Uh, it's very old, Eliza. There's so Eliza is an interesting, 50 years ago, or you know, in 74, yeah. it was already starting to work, mm -hmm. and today it's getting better and better. So refugees, for instance, that don't have access to good psychological uh, help and do have lots of psychological problems, are starting to benefit uh, from these sorts of uh, chatbot. Uh, it's been even tested with people that have compared access to uh, psychological help, human help, and, and bot help, yeah. that sometimes the bot is doing better. Oh. Uh, and the reason is that you can say things to the bot that you cannot say to a human. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not ashamed to come up with things. So that's really the reason Elisa was already working. Okay. And it was not very bright, Elisa, then. Okay. No. But you, know, you can have a brighter Elisa, and that's what people are building these days. Okay. So, and if this updated Elisa Aristotle, I mean, you know, whatever you want, somewhere between Elisa and Aristotle, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why it wasn't Socrates rather than Aristotle, because Socrates was more the interactive one. Than yes, uh, but I think because they wanted Alexander the Great as an example. <laughs> but I would also prefer this because also you know Socrates was more in the questioning, and it's easier to make a bot that questions you than a bot that answers you. Yeah, well, that, that's what what Eliza was doing, basically restating your statements as questions. Also, you you have problems uh, with your life, and you have problems with your mother. And people start to automatically. Uh, but I mean, uh, uh, you know, a personal diary is already a form of a technology for psychological help. 
Okay. Uh, and El Eliza was uh, uh, similar forms, except that you know it was answering back, whereas personal diaries usually don't. Uh, but it's it's very simple uh, ways, and so I think you don't necessarily need much. But you know you can. I, I think the best mentor for me would be giving you some advice of that sort, but also with, will help you to know that you know there is a relaxation technique and there is a way to have the children to cooperate so that there is less tension in the class and, and so on. And so you could be learning both um, in French savoir, savoir être, savoir faire, and savoir vivre. You know. So learning to be, learning, uh, uh, learning uh, concept, and, and learning um, to, to do and learning to live together. Okay. And I think that's that's what we could be uh, fueling into the bot, ideally. Okay. And ideally, the bot would be the interface between your personal intelligence and the distributed collective intelligence, mm -hmm. yeah. which is more or less what you were saying. Okay. But you could say it's not only the the vast amount of the past, but it's also uh, maybe uh, an interface to the collective in distributed intelligence of today. Mm -hmm. okay. So you could, the bot could be relaying your questions to a forum even in a language that you don't speak. So you couldn't do that. Okay? But the bot could. Okay? And then eventually say, you know, oh, I've, I didn't know the answer to your question, but I've asked it to a lot of people, and here is uh, what various people in various uh, parts of the world uh, answer is. Yeah. Okay? And the most appropriate to you, I don't know, you know let me, let's discuss Here's about some options. So you could you could do or this sort of thing, or you could use one of these techniques where uh, people say, "Was this uh, answer useful?" and then you give the most useful answer or the the, the most useful answer. Exactly, so, uh, and and one of the things you can do with a bot is, um, I mean, of course you can ask questions to Google, but when you ask questions to Google, Google doesn't really invite you to refine your question beyond the automatic completion that they do these days. Yeah. Okay, uh, and for instance, if you say, "I have a problem with a kid." Uh, you know, and you type this on Google, you know, the answer you will get is not going to be very precise. But you know, a chatbot will ask you what age is the kid, you know, what has happened, what's the history, what are the parents saying, you know, what are your other colleagues saying, what are the other children saying, you know, you know from all this, progressively, you will get enough information to look for the best possible answer if you have an interesting database to, to look into. But that's the sort of things I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, for the future of this sort of uh, mentoring. Yeah, I, I had a similar idea, but uh, maybe with a bit more practical focus, what I called a universal problem solving service. That is, that you have any problem, you go to a particular place in the web, you describe your problem, and a combination of humans and AI analyze your question, see what's still lacking in there, and eventually find somebody or somewhere or something that gives you the answer. It's the, this mediation between your question, which may be poorly formulated, so you don't Google wouldn't find it, and the answer, which probably is available somewhere on the web, but you need to make the connections. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that would be great to have. The question is basically where to start with, and and you know how to involve people and and prototyping progressively these things. So the the sort of uh, you know uh, how do you reach Eden if that's Eden? Okay, <laughs> how do you uh, where's the pass? towards uh, something that can progressively be learning. And what I like about Elisa is that we know it's already useful, and it was 50 years ago. And it was very simple. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it was super it's simple. It's okay. it's so before we had a universal answer, okay, if you had a system that helps you to question, yeah. uh, it's already useful. Socrates knew he didn't know. And yeah, that I was a lot, because you knew how to ask questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, <coughs> it's, it's a classic uh, statement that Formulating a problem is half the solution. Correct. And most people have a problem and they don't know how to take it because they can't quite formulate what the problem is. Like, my child seems unhappy. But what does it mean, unhappy? Well, uh, he, he cries after he goes to bed or he, he looks angry when he comes to school. And then by questioning, you and can and formulate the problem. Context. And, and, and helping through questioning people define and refine the context and understand uh, part of the solution. I, I fully agree. And so that's why I think we, we, we can, uh, you know, before we get to Aristotle, uh, actually getting to Socrates is easier mm -hmm. because uh, Socrates was more in this questioning mode and Eliza was already doing this. Yeah. And, you know, I've just, you know, tried in the train uh, coming here uh, some of this uh, psychological bot. And they're clearly not perfect, 
but they are uh, already present, and you uh, can think of it one of it's called WISA, W-Y-S-A. Ah, W-Y-S-A, it's WISA. It's sort of a mixture between the WISA and LISA. <laughs> I think, and it's a uh, general thinking I, I've made about uh, the future of technology, is to, the probably most fruitful way is to mix uh, human and artificial intelligence. For example, for this definition of problem or with the chat, there should be a way that at certain point, if the algorithm fails, uh, it, it hands uh, the problem to a human. That's definitely and what we want to do. Yeah. And so, so that the system becomes really good because uh, the AI, especially at the beginning, it won't be able to handle uh, so I, I it will get stuck quickly. Or so first, I mean, a lot of bots are initiated uh, with human beings uh, answering the first sets of questions. And progressively, the bot is learning from that FAQ type of database uh, and eventually uh, putting only questions that have not been asked until then. Yeah. So that's that's already basically the way it's, it's if you are the startups on bots, that's what you would be doing. So that's that's one point. The second one is typically on this psychologic uh, story. I think you know uh, first it's very good if the bot is very humble, okay, and he starts saying you know I don't know that's you know that's I've never heard uh, such a story. Uh, maybe let me if you want I can try to uh, ask others uh, if they can uh, answer to you. Okay, and while keeping your anonymity, if you want, etc. Okay, uh, and and so that that you can you can do, and you can also, uh, and that's what some of the the psychological bots are doing. Uh, say, well, you know, that seems to be uh, something that goes beyond my expertise, uh, but I know professionals that live in your neighborhood that maybe you can go and talk to. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I think you know. To a large extent, uh, the average teachers doesn't know all the human resources that are available to help kids that have all sorts of problems, because there is such a diversity of problems and diversity of institutions, and you know the teachers know at best how to teach, and not much about you know child psychology and child problems and institutional help that can be uh, put out there. <coughs> and so, just putting uh, the teacher in contact with you know, all sorts of professionals could already be helpful. And it's not necessarily professionals for the teacher, it could be professionals for the kids that the teacher wants to help. And already, you know, if the teachers has more solutions to more kids, you know, probably the teachers will feel less depressed. Because I think that part of the depression is not being able to do what they want, which is <coughs> to help children. Because that's, you know, that's what their job is, and that's what they, they choose to do in their life. And I think it's failing. Uh, to achieve what you aim for, which is part of the, of the stress of someone. Yeah, but probably the first uh, step towards this direction is, and like in the movie you were mentioning the documentary, the Finland phenomenon, where they follow the, they explain how the educational system was working there. For example, when a, a child is failing, it's a, it's a challenge for the whole educational team. It's, oh, but why is he failing? Oh, that's really interesting. Why is it not learning? Is it that he has a different cognitive style to learn, or is it that he has issues with his family? Is it that he is bullied at school? Or but, but that's why you know this, this and sort it, of. Is that, and I think that's what we lack, uh, uh, at least in, in France or maybe in Belgium, that there is really a, an no, educational I team that. Uh, I think it that exists in the schools where my daughter has been that they have a sick team. Like that. Yeah, and, 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 and typically, you know, in, if you look at PISA um, comparison, OECD uh, has started to do this. What you describe is basically the way to a solution. It's not very surprising. If you have you know, a collective intelligence of adults trying to solve problems, they're likely to solve it. Okay. Uh, and typically, France, where we don't have time for teachers to come together, uh, and they, they are not trained to collaborate, and they have no incentive to collaborate, and if anything, they have all sorts of institutional uh, feedback not to um, uh, work together. It's it's very hard, and that's why you know we are uh, failing uh, to create the right professional atmosphere to develop those skills, and that's why you know you know everything I was describing you know can be said at every level. That you know starting at the at the teacher collective, I think, is one of the key. 
And, um, and one of the problem of uh, innovative teachers is that they are somewhat like seven vibes. You know, they are innovative in their class, and everyone around them is still in these classical ways of putting chairs and tables, and you know, you enter the building, and you know, by default, this is this is the way you're supposed to do it, and and that's that's tough, and and uh, you know, if you suddenly have you're the only teacher that has children that brings uh, toys and, and and pillows from from home, and and, and the, the class doesn't look like a class, but you know, everyone looks at you in a weird way. Okay, I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, I, have my, I have a train in two hours, so I do have more time if you want to discuss uh, more. Well, uh, we usually go down for a drink afterwards in the cafe here on the campus, so, so just feel it as well. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again. Thank